Uh, how many of you don't? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm with that second crowd. I want to be real quick about this because um, um, we got a surprise for the church here coming up. But we want to talk about pastor appreciation. We've been pushing it for a couple of weeks now. Uh, today's the day that we are honoring our pastor. And if you've not done something for him individually, uh, I want to encourage you to do that. And if you have, um, uh, he appreciates it very much. But as a church. We wanted to get him a special gift this morning, and I believe Brother's coming out with it now. Uh, we, yeah, uh, but um, go ahead and tell him or wait till. All right, here we go. Brand new guitar for a pastor, so um, everybody give our pastor an applause this morning for all he's done for us. And we got another little surprise now, so. Inside the family here, you're a blessing to us. I want to go on record as saying, I believe you're one of the greatest soul winners of our generation. We thank God for you. Thank God for you and your family for being faithful, supporting the side of the family down through the years. May God give you all of the strength and the anointing that you need to continue the journey. Forty big years of the gospel. I remember the days down in Alabama and Georgia as we traveled, Florida. Appreciate you and love you. God bless you. It's still the blood. Shining light. Keep shining the light. Hey, I feel a little preach coming on now, man. <laughs> Woo! Carolina Camp meeting. We hope it goes good. You pray for us. We love you. God bless.
Thank you for being the best papa. Hey, Brother Danny. Thank you for everything that you've done for me. You talked me into marrying Brandon, so that's one good thing. Um, he baptized me. He married me and Brandon, and my life wouldn't be like it is now. I doubt I'd even be in church if you hadn't started shining light. So thank you. Thank you for not quitting. No matter what, you never quit. You never quit. And that's something, and you always forgive, no matter what. You always forgive, and I just wish I could have those qualities, but I don't. So thank you, and I love you from the bottom of my heart, and I always will. And keep going on. Those kids need you, those kids need you. I need you, our church needs you. And I love you, and I hope someday I can be half of what you are. You know, you're just, you're amazing. Thank you. Keep fighting on. I love you. Thank you for preaching about the Lord. Thank you, Brother Danny, for taking us to church. Hello, Brother Danny. Well, the Apostle Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And I want to say that certainly that's true in my life. But not only the grace of God, it's also the people that God has used to influence and impact me through the years. And uh, I just wanted to say how much me and Becca appreciate the influence and the impact that you have had on our lives. I think back to 23 or 24 years ago when you hired me into the ministry, and uh, I never had any idea I would even be a preacher, much less a pastor, and uh, I just appreciate that God used you to get me started on this journey, and uh, I praise the Lord for that, and we're thankful for that influence, and uh, anything that we're ever used to do to bear fruit goes partially to your record. So God bless you on this We love you, day. Brother Danny, for our beautiful church that you preach very good, well lessons in. I just want to say appreciate Brother Danny. Happy uh, Pastor Appreciation Day. Uh, you've never been my literal pastor, but you've been my pastor in a lot of ways over the years. The Lord's used you in a, a great way in my life over and over. The first time I ever heard real preaching was Brother Danny on tape, and uh, the Lord used that and got hooked on it, uh, got right with God uh, over a period of time. But anyway, and the uh, first time I ever really prayed in the Spirit, uh, was uh, hearing Brother Dan preach on prayer on the radio. Uh, first time I ever got kicked in the head while I was praying at the altar uh, was at Watch Night Service a couple of years ago. Uh, but, so there's been a lot of firsts in my life through Brother Dan, but I appreciate you and love you. Thank you. Happy Pastor Appreciation Day, Brother Danny. I just want you to know that I love you and I appreciate everything you've done. And uh, other than my current pastor, you're the best pastor I ever had. And not only are you a good pastor and a, and a good um, preacher, but I'm glad and proud to call you my friend. And I just want you to know that I love you almost as much as I love your girls. Happy, have a good day. Thank you, Brother Danny, for telling me to love Thank you, Brother Danny, for leading me to the Lord. Hey, Brother Danny, I just wanted to thank you for who you are and what you stand for and for your faithfulness to the Lord and, and the huge influence that you've made in my life. You haven't only influenced my life, but my family's life and my community's life. And I just want to thank you for truly who you are and just let you know how much I love you and your family. just like family to me just in another state and I just wanted to say thank you and happy Pastor Appreciation Day. Thank you Brother Danny for preaching the truth. My name is Rick Davis and Brother Danny was my pastor when I was about 10 years old, 29 years ago and my soul wasn't saved under Brother Danny but I believe my life was. Uh, it's been a lot of effort into kids and teenagers pastor today as a result uh, of that effort, and he told me I could uh, to love the Lord and to enjoy my salvation, I could still I could still have fun and be saved, and I think I miss it a lot today, and uh, I just want to thank him uh, for all of his hard work and time and effort that he has put into the ministry, not only uh, in, my, in my life, but uh, many others, uh, hundreds and hundreds of others. Thank you for my loving prayer. Thank you, Brother Danny, for being for us. Hello, Brother Danny. I just wanted to say thank you for pastoring me for all those years. But most of all, I wanted to say thank you for helping me to fall in love with Jesus. 
that's been the most wonderful thing of my life. Wow, have I really been knowing you for 40 years or more? I'm getting, not, I mean, we're not as young as we used to be. Anyway, thank you. Love you. Brother Danny, I want to congratulate you on your 40 years uh, pastoring. I want to say that you have been a blessing to me and my family, and I thank the Lord for you. You've had determination. You've had drive. And uh, and certainly there's been some days of discouragement, but you never let it stop you from continuing on doing what God's called you to do. And from the Hunt family, I want to say thank you, and, uh, and I'm glad that I've got to be kind of a part of your family over these last uh, several years. don't know how many now, but several years. And seeing you girls grow up and and become uh, super uh, young ladies. And that is a tribute to you. And I want to say thank you and uh, for all that you do for the cause of Christ and what you've done for my family directly and indirectly. And so congratulations on the milestone of 40 years uh, in the pastorate. I hope you have a wonderful day. appreciate that. That's awful nice. And my daughters put that together, and I thank them for that. I appreciate that. And I appreciate everything everybody's done. I didn't even know some of them people. What? They've either got old or I ain't seen them a long time or something. There was a couple I wasn't sure about. But anyway, I must have paid them out there on the street somewhere to do that. They hired, uh, so give you $20, you'll say something nice about my daddy. Uh, but anyway, I've already got people paid to cry at my funeral if I ever have one. I want at least two people to cry and others will be shouting. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I thank you for that. I don't take stuff like this real good. I'm not good at it. It's embarrassing, but I thank you. And I'm, I love our church and uh, my heart's in it 100%. Come on, Miss Desi. We'll have just a little quick time of fellowship and then we're going to uh, move on. Uh, we're really glad that that God's brought us all together like this. The Lord knows what he's doing, don't he? He knows what he's doing. And uh, he don't, he, as old folks said, he maketh no mistakes. God makes no mistakes. And you're here, I'm, I'm here, all of us are here for a reason. He's brought you here for a reason. And it's to work in your life. And I hope that you'll, you won't just say, well, it's just an accident. Uh, it's no, there are no accidents. And so uh, let's let's uh, have a little short time of fellowship. Then we'll we'll move right along this this morning. Okay, uh, we have some visitors here. Make yourself at home. All these folks over here, all the way from up in northern Illinois, and, and uh, they're motorcycle riders. So uh, make them welcome. Let's all stand. Be just uh, just a minute of fellowship, right quick. And we'll move on. Be friendly to somebody around you. Sound man, help me. One, two. Leave the projector on. Should project your volume so I'm All right. 
right, let's get back to the seats now. Amen. Everybody find your seat. All right, I'm going to try this thing out here. I appreciate Brother Jason uh, helping me. Victor, I've never had a guitar this nice in, uh, ever in my life. I always wanted one, but uh, I wasn't willing to do it. But uh, I've always, uh, I used to play in a band when I was about 12 and 13. All guys back then played in bands. And I uh, wore my fingers out trying to learn how to play the guitar when I was about 12 years old. And then we started playing. Many of you know that story. But I wound up in a band when I was about 14. And by this time, I was playing basketball. And uh, the guys in our band was older than me. And uh, they were getting out and sin and stuff. And I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. My mom preached to me all the time. And one day, we was in the gym at basketball practice. And uh, the guys in the band come in the gym at Nebo and said, we're having band practice. We, want, we need you out of here. And I looked at the coach, and Coach Laney looked back at me, and he said, boy, you have to make up your mind if you're going to play music or basketball. I said, I'm playing basketball. And they walked out, and I quit the band and, laid, and didn't even mess with it until after I got saved, then played a little bit. And now it's about two times a year. But I guess I'll have to do it more since, uh, since I have a nice guitar. But I'm going to try this song. Uh, give me up just a tap, that projector volume. I'm going to try this song. Never done this before, but it, I was thinking about it, and it reminds me of today. And I want to sing it for the Lord and especially for my girls today. As I look back on this road, I've traveled There's been many times He's carried me through If there's one thing I'd have learned In my life My Redeemer Is faithful and true My Redeemer Is faithful and true Everything He said He will do Every morning His mercies are new My Redeemer is faithful and true My heart rejoices when I read the promise There is a place that I'm preparing for you one day soon I'll see my Lord face to face. My Redeemer is faithful and true. You can trust Him. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything He said He will do. Every morning His mercy are new. My Redeemer is faithful and true. And in every situation, He has proved His love for me. When I lack the understanding, He gives more grace to me. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything he said he will do. Every morning his mercies are new. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Jesus is faithful and true. Ruin your singing voice, and it will. You can't. You just scratch after this long screaming, ever, ever, uh, almost every day. 
for many, many years. All right, turn me down, please. One, two, three. You're getting there. Four, five. Okay, good. Um, I want to take just a few minutes this morning. There's something else on my heart, and I want to say again, thank you, thank you. That is a nice guitar. Jason said Garth Brooks would play that. And the Lord sure needs one better than him, than what he's got. Amen. His fans burn their hands on the stage lights for him. Uh, but anyway, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't do good with stuff like this. I'm telling you, I don't. Uh, I love y'all. I'm not a person that's real emotional all the time. And I don't show it. Uh, people always said, I, you can ask my girls, I don't show my love a lot, but I love very deep. And when God called me to preach, it was very, very deep. Very deep. I can't even tell you what it was like. I would like to talk about it for a few minutes. So take your Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11, two places. And then I'm going to uh, give you a few thoughts this morning. I'd like to to remind you about the service tonight. Be here at 6 o'clock. Bring somebody with you. Uh, then our study Wednesday night, we're finishing up the book of Judges in another week or so. And then Saturday, we're going visiting. Saturday, going visiting. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We'll look here in chapter 2, and then we're going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul was not never had the office of a pastor that I know of. The word pastor means uh, same as bishop, overseer, ruler, under shepherd. The pastor is not a dictator, but he is a spiritual leader. And uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit for a little while. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19, here he's just overjoyed because of these people that he's got to lead to the Lord. For what is our jo hope or joy or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye, Paul told these people, are our glory and joy. He said, man, it tickles the fire out of me when I think about y'all going to heaven. Now, there's another side to pastor in a church. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And look at verse 27. This is the part uh, of, that a lot of young preachers don't see and don't know, but it's definitely a part of it. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, and you'll see verse number 27. In weariness, in painfulness, sometimes it's painful, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? You know what he's saying there? He's saying, when you hurt, I hurt. When you feel bad, I feel bad. He said, he was saying, when you're going through trouble, I'm going through trouble. There's, that's the positive and negative head and tail side of pastoring a church. So I want to preach just for a minute this morning on the joy and heartaches of a pastor. I know I'm called to preach when I was 19, and I got saved when I was 18. Several months later, I went to work preaching, come home preaching. I got, went to sleep preaching got up preaching in, in my head. And I worked on this machine on the second shift right over here off exit 100. Y'all remember the old Highlander plant? And I'd go down through there working on that, on that uh, machine, and it'd be 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I was going down through there, and in my head I was preaching. And I could see crowds of people out there, and I was just letting them have it. I was a lot better preacher in my mind then than I am literally now. And it's different when it's real people and they're really getting mad at you. And uh, I, but I, but I remember doing that. And I remember it started building up. And man, somebody needs to say that. Man, somebody needs to say that. Man, I need, I need to, somebody needs. And I, I'd never been to Bible college. Still haven't. I'm not proud of that. I sometimes I wish I had. But I, 
felt that God, what God calls a person to preach. You do not choose the ministry. You are chosen for the ministry. All through the Bible, God picked out prophets. He said, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to do the other. And that's what he did. I give him the glory this morning. It's hard to believe anybody can, can, can do this that long. I was thinking this week, I thought, 40 years. It, in one way, it just seems like two years ago. In another way, it seems like it's been 120. It depends on what part of it you're thinking about. Uh, my sister's here this morning, Debbie over there. And she knows, she know, you know, she remembers when I got saved and I got called to preach. And, and carry, my girls don't because they were all, uh, weren't even born. And uh, I, I preached literally, literally tens of thousands of times. I want to go on record this morning giving God the glory. Because this might change today. I, I am the only preacher that I know of or have ever met that's been preaching this long and I have never had to miss one time to preach because of sickness. Not once. That's, I don't know of any. I give the Lord the glory. That's the Lord the glory. I might fall over here before I get through this morning. If he chooses to do that, that's his. he gets all the glory for that. Lord in mercy. I mean, I've had airplanes that were late. I've had uh, snow, got snowed out different places. Uh, I think one time I didn't get to teach on Wednesday night because of something, I, and I'm not sure about that, but I've never had to miss one time to preach in 40 years because of sickness. That's, that's amazing. I give God the glory. I mean, when it's cold, when it's hot, when things were bad, things were good, you name it. And I praise the Lord for that. I want to talk first of all, about things that I love about pastoring. I, I first wanted to be an evangelist. I, when I first started preaching, I seen these evangelists come through, preach a count meeting, I said, that's what I want to do right there. Because, I mean, anybody can play, play a, a song, sing a song, or, I mean, uh, anybody can do that. And, I, and I, liked, I liked basketball better than I did playing music, and I still do, still do. Uh, I, I still would rather play ball and play a guitar any day of the week. But, I thought, anybody can do that. I want to do something nobody else can do. And I said, if I can do something that nobody else can do, then I found what God has called me to do. Because God does have something for you and all of us that nobody else can do but you. Right? And he does. He's got a plan for your life. I told some kids at the gym the other day. They was out of school. And they was all, two boys, two girls. They was about 14. And I said, y'all, I preached to them there for a little bit. And I said, God has a plan for your life. And the devil has a plan for your life. And you get to vote which way it goes. Whichever way you cast your vote, that's which way your life goes. So I wanted to be an evangelist. And I thought, man, wouldn't it be great to just travel from place to place and get to preach revivals and see people get saved? Woo! That, I never even thought about being a pastor. The first revival that I ever preached by myself, I think I was, I think I was 19 or 20 when uh, Bill Long let me preach one night of their revival. I might have been 20, I don't know. I think I was 19. And I hadn't been preaching very long. I went up in the woods and prayed. And it liked to kill me trying to get ready. And uh, I finally preached a revival by myself. It was over on the other side of Hendersonville. I think I was 20, 20 years old, I think. And um, that, I went over there, that church, it looked like a million people. It was about as half as big as this. And the pastor got up over there and he said, we have this young man and, and God's going to use him uh, to preach our revival. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I, just, I was so excited. And I, I didn't know that you were supposed to study ahead of time and have a lot of stuff ready. I just thought about 4 o'clock that evening it hit you and you, and you jumped up and, and said it. And Because it did happen to me like that a time or two. And I thought, okay, I, I can do this. I got up that first night, I screamed, I hollered, I ranted, I raved, and it, and it went pretty good. And the next night, I was hoarse, couldn't hardly, my throat was hurting. And I, I had Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, fr by Friday night, I was saying, whew, whew, one more night of that. I, I couldn't stand the pressure. I, you, I couldn't eat. I couldn't, you, you, it's like a big knot. You know that nervous feeling you get before something really, you got, that's why I felt all day long. And I had knots in my stomach. And I thought, oh, God, I'll be glad when it's over with. They might be getting revived, but I'm getting full of the devil. I felt like I was getting backslid. I thought, I can't wait till this is over with. And, and um, I think it's Friday night or Saturday night come, and a bunch of people come, started getting, I was, I was tore all to pieces. I was absolute. And when it was over, I, I thought, 
Whew, I'm glad this is over. And the pastor got up. He said, this revival has gone so good, I think we'll go again next week. I went, oh, my goodness. Everybody said, amen, praise the Lord. I went, oh, no, praise the Lord. I done preached everything I knew and about stuff I didn't know. I really did, I really did. I preached Noah was in the ark seven days before the flood came. I made that a picture of the tribulation. You can do that. If you want. that that's not right. Because the Lord told him at the first verse, come thou into the ark. And then he said, yet seven days. I took that literal. I thought he went in there and stayed seven days before the water came. And I preached that. And I, and, and I preached a bunch of stuff. And the pastor was very nice. He didn't say nothing to me. But I thought, I cannot do this another week. By the time that second week was over, I thought I was going to die. Then I, I finally learned, it's just like running a race something. You, learn to, you have to learn to pace yourself. That's like true with anything. When you're running, you can't just take off 90 miles an hour. You'll be laying out there in the road somewhere and everybody else pass. You have to learn to, to pace yourself. And as a preacher, you don't have to say everything you know every time you get up on every subject. Some still have not learned that. And you don't have to say everything that pops in your head. That's why the Lord don't call women to preach. Shut up. Uh, but it's the truth. And uh, you just because something comes in your head don't mean you've got to say it. Right, husbands? Filter them out about three-fourths of that, and you can still get your point across. And I couldn't do that. I got to where I thought, I, I, I got little by little by little, and I thought, I, I can get this. I can get this. I, I know how to shoot a free throw. I know how to play a guitar. I can figure this out. And you know, after all these years, I can tell you, I still haven't got this figured out. There's something about preaching that, that you never can get the handle on. Just about the time you think you're doing good, you're going down on your face. And then you humble and think you ain't no good, God will use you. And then you start thinking, I'm doing pretty good, bam, you go down again. And then you start thinking, okay, Lord, help me, have mercy on me. And the Lord helps you. He, he, it's, it's elusive. It's like trying to catch a, a fish or something underwater. You, you can never get it and say, okay, I got this figured out. I know. Nobody ever has. I've met some that thought they did, but nobody's ever figured out it's supernatural. The Spirit of God will touch somebody while they're preaching, and that's something that you can't plan. You, it, you don't write it into the message. You don't plan it into the service. It's, it's a touch from the Spirit of the Lord on His Word. That there, And I want to tell you something else. There's nothing in this world that will help you like real, good, Bible preaching touched by the Holy Spirit. Nothing like it. If you've ever heard it, you're ruined as far as this world's concerned. If you've ever been around real preaching. Now, some people go to church every Sunday and don't never hear nothing. And I feel sorry for them. You might as well just, uh, you'd be better off go fishing. But if you, if you ever went to a real church and heard real preaching, and I did, it got in me. And then I got to where, I, uh, uh, Brother Jason, Brother Derek, he probably knows what I'm talking about. I got to where I'd go somewhere and I would preach. And there'd be a young person get saved. And then they'd bring their daddy, and he'd come down there and get saved. And they'd say, pray for my, pray for my mama. Uh, she's full of the devil. She's on drugs. She's this. And they'd bring her, and she'd get saved. And I'd sort of get to know them, and I'd know their name. And at the end of the week, they'd say, Brother Danny, we won't see you no more. And I sort of start, felt myself starting to get attached to them. And I didn't want to leave them. And right then is when the Lord started putting it in my heart. I want to be a pastor. At first, I didn't. And then I started, I mean, I really, I thought, I care about these people. I'd like to mentor them. I'd like to feed them. I'd like to train them. But, Lord, I'm not, I've never even been to school. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing myself. How can I help them? And it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And on my knees in a little house up there behind East Side Baptist Church in Nebo, wasn't even there then, I got down the floor one night and said, okay, I'm going to do it. I met with six of my friends. I said, y'all, Lord told me to start a church. Y'all can do what you want to. And they said, we're with you. And seven of us held the first service up there at New Manor on March the 6th, 1977. I was scared to death. I then realized that God gave me a pastor's heart. One of the great things I love about pastoring is teaching and preaching. What an honor to preach that book right there. There's no greater job in the world. There's no higher office. 
old Trump ain't got the highest office in the land. Pastors who's handled this book do. There is no other calling on this earth higher than to preach this book and a higher office than the pastor of a local Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. Sometimes it'd be hard, and sometimes I'd feel like I'm discouraged and all that, and I'd tell myself, man, this is a privilege. This is a privilege. You better jump up there and thank God that he's given you the privilege of, of speaking to people. Never take it lightly. I, I, I've never, as far as I know, never went into the pulpit one time with this flippant attitude of, oh, it don't matter. I'll just say something. Get never, never. I've always took this job seriously. I understand God's watching me. I understand I'm going to give an account of what I say up here. I'm going to give an account of how, which direction I push you in, how I lead the church. I'm going to give an account of all that. And, and I love that. We labor in the Word and in doctrine. There's a great reward in that. You know what I love about pastoring? I love watching people get saved and grow. I couldn't tell you the times. We had an old boy coming up there one time in our, in our old building, and it was an old, old uh, building we bought, had a basement downstairs, and I mean we had that place packed, jammed full. And this, this lady comes, she said, Brother Danny, my husband's coming this Sunday. He said, please pray for him, please. He's coming this morning. Please come and he's coming this morning. I said, I'll pray, I'll pray, and I prayed all. And he was there, sat way over here on this side. And uh, it was packed full. You could, there's people sitting there like this right here. But we built that new building, and it was all jammed in there like that and everything. And there he was, and I prayed, and I said, Hallelujah. I prayed, glory to God. Woo, hallelujah. Uh, the Lord's going to save that guy. And, and, uh, and, and he didn't get saved. And next week, I said, well, what did he say? She said, he looked around and said, this dad Jim place is going to fall in. That was his assessment of our service. Sometimes you can't just go off people's approval. He said, well, nobody ever encouraged you. You, can't, you better have more in your heart than expecting people to confirm you and approve of you. Because, buddy, sometimes it just ain't there. Sometimes it's all by yourself. Man, come one time in that same building. I was upstairs. She told me, she said, pray for my husband, pray for my husband, pray for my husband, pray for my husband. And I looked out the window, and I saw him walking across the street. About that time, she, uh, the, the old church on a hill, and she ripped her hose on a rose bush or something out there and got all aggravated and said, Come on, we're leaving. I'm, I said, Oh, my goodness, the devil ripped her hose, and now they're leaving. And I run down the steps. I thought, They're leaving. There goes a lost man leaving the church. And I run down the steps, and I walked across the street and said, Hey, where are you going? Oh, uh, nowhere. We just, uh, I said, come on in. Well, I told her, it don't matter. Ain't nobody got no business looking down there no way. And they came in, and he did get saved. Is that right, Ronnie? Sitting back there on the back row, raise your hand. That was over 30 years ago. Raise it again so the rest of them can see. Amen, brother. But I love that part about pastor. You know what I like to see? Here's one of the greatest things about pastor church is to see somebody come in and they sit like this the first time. First two or three times it comes like this the whole time. And then about halfway through it, you see them go. Oh, I liked it, didn't you? Like tater chips, you can't eat just one. You come one time, boy, it makes you want to come again if it's real. And then you see them and they come up and they get saved. And they get saved. One of the most amazing things in the, in the Christian life is to watch a young convert come in. First thing you know, they're coming to Sunday school. Next thing you know, they're carrying a Bible. Next thing you know, you can tell they clean they clean their their life up. They clean to start setting up closer and closer. That's an amazing process. That's, that's I'll never get over seeing God working. Man, that's a blessing. Man, that's a blessing. But we don't bat a thousand, but brother, when you finally see somebody get it and they get closer and closer and get all the way in, it makes it worth every bit of work you put into it. And what's, what's a blessing is see families, see families crying at the altar, hugging necks. I've been lots of places where the whole family, dad, mom, the kids, maybe mom and dad separated, stand there crying, hold, holding each other, hugging necks. And I get to go home thinking, thank 
God there's a family put together. Thank God the devil didn't get them kids. Thank God. That's a blessing, y'all. That's a blessing. I ran into a guy the other day, funeral home. Uh, thir- uh, one, I think it's Thursday. I had to go to the funeral home. This, this girl, I hadn't seen her in 20 years. I said, you remember me? She said, I sure do. You're Brother Danny. And her husband, he said, that's Danny Castle? She said, yes. He said, I want to hug you. And he's hugged my neck. I had no idea who he was. He said, I used to ride the bus to that church when I was just a little boy. And he said, I thank you. Listen, folks, there, there's, no, there's, nothing, there's nothing in the world. I never get tired of hearing that. You know, one of the things I like is when I run into somebody and they'll say, Brother Danny, I ain't heard you preach in 30 years, and you ain't changed a bit. And I'm not talking about physically. Shut up. Y'all don't look so hot yourself. Uh, and they'll say, I could close my eyes and I couldn't tell no difference. You're preaching now than I could before. Listen, when I started preaching 30, 40 years ago, I believed this book. It's 40 years later, I still believe this book. When I started preaching 40 years ago, I believed Jesus was the only way to heaven. I still believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. You say, well, you're just a narrow-minded, old, hard-headed. No, 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 here's how. Here's why, here's why I'm like that. You say, how come you don't change? Because when I got saved, 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 2 is still 4. When I got saved, the sun was hot. The sun is still hot. See, when you're right, you don't change with the time. Now, there's some things I've had to change on because I didn't know what I was talking about. But what I'm right on in this book, you'd never, ever, ever, ever change. And if you're waiting on us to bring the new Bibles in and the rock band and everything, you you better get you a mighty soft pew because by the grace of God, as long as I'm in my right mind, it ain't happening. Uh, I mean, I'll tell some bad stuff in a second, but I'll tell you a good thing. happened not long ago. Uh, I run into somebody and they said, they said, Danny, did you know that the Huffington Post is talking about you? And I said, what's the Huffington Post? I never heard of such a, a, a immature, uneducated bunch like that. And they said, it's a big news organization. It's worldwide. And they report news on the, on the, on the Internet. And they're talking about you. And I said, Why? They said you was crazy and they cussed you and lo- you lost your mind because I preached against a cartoon that showed God committing suicide and people burning their parents and stuff and I raised Cain about it. And anybody in their right mind would raise Cain about it. And I still, all those family guy cartoons and everything, if you, listen, if you ain't got enough sense to know them wrong, you, you're, you're lacking, really. You're really lacking in first base education. It was Wonder Shows them. That show, they had an MTV show or some one of them. I don't even know what channel it was. So somebody got it on and showed it, and boy, they give me down the road. Pastor he loses his blank mind. He talked about me often. They said, how's that make you feel? And I thought, well, it hurts my feelings a little bit. I mean, get cussed, made fun of them, told them I lost my mind in front of the whole world. On the other hand, I consider that a real compliment. If them people like you, you're a sick pervert. You know that? That's right. Birds of a feather flock together. And not a few months later, I got a phone call. And this lady called. She said, is this Danny Castle? She said, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, me and my friend watch you every week. We love y'all's church. We love you. And she talked on for a minute, and she said, I'm going to send you some money for your buses and what y'all do for them kids. And I said, okay, sure, that's great. Thank you very much. She said, I'm going to send you $500 to help with those bus kids. And I said, praise the Lord, sister. And we talked to her man. I said, by the way, how, how do you even know who, how do you know me? She said, well, my friend, um, I have this friend. She said, I was looking at the Huffington Post, and they were talking bad about this preacher. We should check him out. <laughs> And I about shouted when she told me that. I said, the Lord used them dumb Huffington Post retarded editors to send us $500 for the Lord's work. That's the way God works. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? I ain't got time. I can tell you a bunch of stories like that. 
But I'll say, say this, and I'm done. Things, I started, to, I started to say things that I love about pastoring and things that I hate about pastoring. But some of y'all don't like that word hate, so I'll say things I do not love about pastoring. You fill in the blank. One thing is, I don't have a pastor. I wish that I had a pastor. Closest man I ever had to be my pastor for a while passed away, Preacher Hollifield. I have friends. I understand you can call, I can call so-and-so and some of these guys on here. I can call them if I need to talk. But I don't have a pastor. And sometimes I'd like to be able to just go to my pastor and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need help. I need to make this decision. I, I miss that. I like to have that. I don't like the heartbreak. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 19, he said, We serve the Lord with many tears. Many tears. Listen, a real ministry has tears involved in it. Real men cry. You know that, right? Jesus Christ wept at the tomb of Lazarus, people. You're not, there's nothing sissy or effeminate about a man crying if he's crying over the right thing. The apostle Paul shed many tears. 2 Corinthians 2, 4, I wrote to you with many tears. 2 Timothy 1, 4, being mindful of your tears. Uh, you know, it, it's heartbreaking when you try and you try and you try and you try and it just don't happen. And you preach and you preach. and You know what, one thing, one thing that's always has bothered me, when you go, you go sometimes all seven days a week, so up half a night in a, in a hospital in Charlotte, then a hospital in Asheville the next day, and then all, all day with two hours sleep, uh, mow your grass the whole time you're home, and then try to study and pray and fast and, and everything, and, and, you, and, you, and you don't even see your family. I miss my kids' birthday parties. I miss, that, you know, this, that. And then you meet some smart on the cup town and said, you got it made. Don't work but one day a week. Man, it's hard to deal with them guys like that. Every, and that last guy that said it to me, he said, you got it made, you don't work one day a week. And I said, well, why don't you start you a church if it's so easy and, and get rich and, and try it, big boy. <laughs> See how you like it. I don't do that to them. It hurts. It's like the only way I could describe it is if you worked and cleaned your house and fixed your best meal for somebody and worked all week and paid for it out of your pocket and had every, biscuits, everything in the oven, everything ready, and then you, the, your guests didn't even show up and didn't even call and tell you they wasn't coming. That hurts. That hurts. It hurts. You don't have no idea how that hurts. It hurts when people say, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not being fed. I want to have a Bible study, and they don't even come on Wednesday night. That hurts. We study the Bible every Wednesday night, more than you want. There's always somebody in the church that says, I want, why don't we have a, a separate little Bible study? Well, we study the Bible every week. You, you do that part first, okay? Then we might go to something else. It hurts when people say, I think the church should do this and this, and don't even put their tithes and offerings in. But ready to criticize everything. It hurts. People say, well, how come the church ain't growing? And never visit, never knock on one door, won't help him. That hurts, y'all. That hurts. I'll be honest with you, that hurts my feelings. For the Lord and for you. One lady called one time, she said, I'm going to kill you. I said, you ain't done it. And she said, I'm a witch and I'm going to put a hex on you. I said, go ahead. You can't put no hex on me. I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. I said, the blood of Jesus is more powerful than every witch in the United States. She said, well, I'll put a, a curse on you. I said, you ain't going to do nothing. One guy called me one night in the middle of the night. He said, I'm going to come over and burn your house down, Danny. I said, no, 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 no. No, you're not. Calm down. I sort of thought he might now. <laughs> He's drunk. Every time he'd get drunk, he'd call me. And he'd come over and pull up in my driveway. And I'd say, well, I don't want him in the house drunk and cussing. So I'd go out of the house and go out and sit down in the truck with him. And he'd cuss and he'd rant and rave and then he'd start preaching. He'd start quoting scripture and he said, Danny, you're, you're a great preacher. He said, don't you let the devil mess you up, don't you? And honest to goodness, I was sitting there getting, hey, he was helping me. <laughs> How messed up is that? A drunk comes over and counsels the preacher and he gets helped by it. That's crazy. But the Lord, the Lord can use a jackass in the Bible. The Lord use a chicken to help him. He can use a drunk to help me. That's right. 
I know I was going to say all that. I've seen him use several like that. But anyway, one lady, she said, she said, I'm going to kill you because you called my mom a bad name. I said, who is your mom? She said, I didn't even know who it was. A whole bunch of people sitting there, and you say something, and they think you're talking to them. Must be guilty. I want to say this morning, I'm, and I'm through. It hurts when people say, well, why don't you? You know one of the things that hurts me is when people always expected my kids to be perfect. Growing up, they did. When they was all little, they was like this. Carrie was older, of course, and we'd go out to eat. Honest to goodness, people used to think she was my wife. They thought Chris and Corey was our kids because they was real little. And she loved that because she was, you know, 15, 16. So now I was 19. <laughs> but she's older than I am now. But anyway, they'd say, oh, is this your wife and kids? And she thought that was so cool because people thought she was older. And then they started coming running in and out of the church and everything. And the first time I heard it, they said, well, why don't he do something with his kids? And boy, I did something with my kids. Then when I get older and I preach something, you know, I mean, they're grown married now. They make their own decisions. I still preach to them. I'll ask them. If they're off track, I'll text them or send them. I'll say, you better straighten up. One's gone on vacation today, and I sent her a good text last night. <laughs> Trust me, she's in the airplane somewhere between here and Florida. But I said, uh, if I preach on something, people say, well, why don't he tell his girls to do that? That You know, that ain't right and it ain't fair. They ain't no different than your kids. My kids ain't no different than yours. I've heard I've people come here and say, well, his girls never spoke to me. You know, just stuff like that, that hurts. When they expect, you expect the preacher's kids to be perfect. And I could preach a whole sermon on how people expect the preacher. Oh, his daughter. His da you know, and, and they're, listen, they don't always do what I want them to. The truth, they hardly ever do what I want them to. <laughs> to be flat out honest, they've never done what I want them. I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, I'm thankful for them, and I thank God they're saved and love the Lord. And all three sons-in-law are saved and love the Lord. I thank God for that. But never make the mistake of judging somebody's somebody by their family, their mom, dad, or anybody. We're all going to stand before God for ourselves. And that's what's on my heart this morning. I think we need to. I think every one of us need to, you know how some, sometimes when your shoe comes untied and you have to stop tight, real tight? Sometimes we need to do that. Blessed be the tie that binds, folks. And we ought to just bind in here together and get the job done that God's called us to do. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, if you don't know if you died today, you can be saved. You can get saved here today. You don't get saved by, by joining a church or by doing something else or swallowing something or eating something or going somewhere, you get saved because you trust the Lord Jesus Christ dying for your sins. That's how you get saved. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. No one's talking. We're playing soft. We'll just, we won't have any singing. We'll just play softly for a minute. God's speaking to your heart today. God's speaking to your heart today. Maybe you won't just get in this altar and say, you know what? I want to start on that journey you've been talking about. I've been on this journey a long time now, y'all. Maybe you need to start. Come on, ma'am. Come on, sir. Just get down here and get down on your knees. And say, you know what? I want to start on that journey. Maybe you've been on it and got sidetracked. I want to get back get back on it this morning. Just come and pray. Say, Lord, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Maybe you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. If you don't know today, if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. Let me tell you how easy it is to get saved. The Bible said, if thou shalt call, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You understand you're a sinner. You understand Jesus died for your sins. You understand that he paid the price for you on the cross of Calvary. And you get saved by trusting what he did for you, plus nothing. No church, no preacher, no priest, no pope, nobody can save your soul. Only Jesus Christ.
turn to Him right now. Father, I thank You so much for all that You've done for us. Thank You for special days like this. Thank You, Lord, for these people that You've given us here at Shining Light Baptist Church. What an honor it is to be able to stand here week after week and call this our church and our local body of believers right here in Morganton. I pray that you'd bless everyone here today, bless those that are listening uh, by, by means of Internet and online. I pray you'd bless every one of them. Send us laborers, Lord. Send us help. Send us the help we need, dear God. Have mercy on us. Bless these in the altar. Help every one of us to make up our mind to serve you with all of our hearts. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So I'm still praying this morning. Amen. Amen.